Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started with the lightning round session. Uh, we have a, a great group of um, presenters and I will hand off the mic to our moderator, Melissa. Thanks, Reed. All right, y'all, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, day two of RDAP Summit 2021. This is our second round of lightning talks. Um, we have four lightning talks um, in this session. As a reminder, this is a Zoom webinar. Um, attendees are muted and your cameras are turned off. Um, to ask a question, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, the session will run from 11.20 to 11.50, that specific time, um, with the last 10 minutes reserved for Q&A. So again, make sure you pop those into the Q&A box. Um, we, of course, still have our Discord server set up for more informal conversations um, running throughout the summit. Please feel free to continue to use that for your discussions. Um, again, um, the Research Data Access and Pre Preservation Summit organizers are very committed to providing an environment where all attendees can participate fully in the program and activities without fear of harassment or discriminatory behavior of any kind. Um, please, please um, report any violations by contacting a Code of Conduct officer in Discord. You can also email codeofconduct at rdapassociation.org or you can complete the incident form that is pinned to the um, Code of Conduct Discord discussion thread. Um, and with all of that being said, I am going to switch over to start the lightning round. So give me just a moment while I do some quick screen toggling and sharing. Hello, I'm Jonathan Petters, Assistant Director of Data Management and Curation Services in Virginia Tech's University Libraries and a Data Curation Network representative. I'm joined by Wanda Marsalek, Engineering Liaison and Data Curation Librarian in the University of Minnesota Libraries and a Data Curation Network Curator. Here we will update you, the RDAP community, on two happenings within the Data Curation Network this year. First, a bit of background for those of you unfamiliar with the network. The Data Curation Network, or DCN, is a consortium of US-based data curation services groups to share expertise. The current vision of the DCN is to create and openly share data curation procedures and best practices and support training and development opportunities for an emerging data curator professional community. The Data Curation Network also aims to be a sustainable entity that continues to grow. To this end, the data, uh, it is currently planning a transition from grant funding to a membership model and DCN partner institutions have already begun committing funds. Coming with this transition to funding through membership is an opportunity for other institutions and maybe individuals to participate in and join the DCN. This means all of you and your institutions. There have been active discussions about what different tiers of membership will entail, and these discussions are ongoing. That said, the current iteration of this membership model as made public in late January is as shown here. This shows proposed tiers of membership from a top tier of DCN partner to a lower tier where DCN curators present to and provide guidance on data curation activities to an institution or organization. Note that the middle tier here in the middle, tier two is quite hand wavy and is still in discussion. And as can be seen in the last entry, prospective sponsors of data curation Network activities will not be turned away. If you are interested in participating, would like to hear more about how you might participate and contribute to the DCN or have input to share in the DCN and its plans, please contact us through uh, this form at this URL here at the top, or you can reach out to any one of the DCN team representatives, including me directly. The representatives are listed at the second URL. These will both be shared with you with our slides and script. Wanda will now talk about one of the many initiatives the DCN community is undergoing regarding racial justice. Wanda. Thank you, John. I'm going to brief you all about how this initiative came about and how we're moving it forward. At last July's All Hands meeting, one of the sessions of focus was racial justice in the DCN. The session provided an opportunity for all attendees to submit action-based suggestions on how the DCN can support racial justice. 
through our work, which includes curation, education, primer creation, and community building. One of the questions asked was, what are 10 actions that you would like the DCN to take in support of racial justice as a network of people and in our curation work? The group came up with a long list. Long lists are common in DEI work, and we didn't want the list to be the end of the work. So organizing the list into themes helped show us how to move forward. With the themes in mind, we then asked attendees the question, I would be most interested in participating in the following ways to continue DEI work. 48% were interested in a facilitated workshop, and that is what we're currently focusing on. A smaller working group reached out to facilitators. After a very brief request for proposal and using a rubric, we selected an external facilitator. The small group continued to pre-plan with the facilitator for a larger facilitated workshop with all of the DCN members that resulted in two of the same workshops to allow for better participation and takeaways. With the workshop being facilitated by someone who is not affiliated with any of the current institutions, there will be room for tough questions to be asked and tough conversations. With the help of the facilitator, we hope to develop a path together for the DCN and as individuals at our home institutions to look past our own individual racism and work on breaking down structural and institutional racism by supplementing our existing practices of curated and fair steps with fate is just one step on the path. All this takes time and we hope to be able to share more with you next year. Many groups and organizations are doing similar work. Sharing how we came to these steps could be helpful to others. Thank you very much, and we look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Gunderman, and I'm going to talk today about reflections on best practices from a neurodivergent and anxious RDM librarian. So I'm going to be using two terms today, neurodiversity and anxiety, and I want to give some definitions for those just so everybody's on the same page. The definition that I'll be using for neurodiversity is a concept where neurological differences are to be recognized and respected as any other human variation. And the uh, definition for generalized anxiety disorder, which is what I am referring to when I talk about anxiety today, is a disorder characterized by excessive, uncontrollable, and often irrational worry about events or activities. I broke up with best practices last year, and here's why. So I started my job in summer 2019, and after several months as a new data librarian, I decided to make some changes in how I shared information with my researchers. I'm a neurodivergent person who also struggles with anxiety, and when using the phrase best practices, I always worried how my researchers would feel if they couldn't keep up with these best practices. Would they feel like bad researchers? There's many reasons why a person might not be able to do all of these best practices, including ability, institutional access, financial access, so on and so forth. I also noticed that some of the things I was teaching and almost taking for granted, like open data, data sharing, are actually quite terrifying to some people, including myself. And all of this really solidified when I found this article called Open Science is Really Scary. And it talks about that fear of putting your data out there and that vulnerability. So a disclaimer as you're watching this presentation, I do not speak for everybody when I talk about neurodiversity and anxiety. These are my own experiences. In this presentation, I don't want you to think that I don't teach good management practices in my workshops. I absolutely do. I'm still teaching things like the 3 to one technique, file naming, documentation, so on and so forth. So what does anxiety for me look like in RDM? The first is having difficulty keeping up with all of these recommended practices that we teach. So consistent file names, backups, versioning, et cetera. In my own research, I have a hard time keeping up with all of these things. Feeling like I didn't start early enough. We often teach start RDM from day one, start it before day one, but life is chaotic. And there's a lot of reasons why we might not do that. And then collaborative teams. I can certainly have guidelines on how I'd like my team to name their files, where I want them to store things. At the very end of the day, I cannot control what they do. 
And that is a big source of anxiety. So what I bring to my workshops in light of all this, I do not use the phrase best practices in my workshops. I use recommended practices. And I'm still teaching, again, I'm still teaching all of these best practices, just framed in a different way. I re reiterate many times that many of us didn't learn these concepts in school. A lot of our classes do not talk about RDM. I like to give a call to action for RDM that's small, but allows for meaningful growth. And then reminding people that it won't be perfect. Sometimes good enough is okay. As long as there's, you know, these certain data restrictions and mandates being followed. So what does this look like in my workshops? On the top left, you can see one of my slides that I start off many of my workshops with. It just reiterates that many of us aren't taught these concepts. If you learn about things in the workshop and you feel bad you haven't been doing them, please don't. You're wonderful. These will help you be a better researcher. And then in the bottom right, just talking about next steps at the end of a workshop. What are things you learned today that you can incorporate? You know, could you do three things from this workshop? If not, could you do one thing? Uh, five minutes a week is a great way to start your RDM practice. Basically just trying to give a meaningful call to action. And it works. The feedback from my participants has been very positive. It's anecdotal. I don't have any quantitative metrics to show you today, but it is very impactful what I hear from people sharing with me after my workshops. And it's part of a broader inclusive RDM initiative around trying to make RDM education inclusive and understanding that this stuff is hard and not everybody can meet those best practices. So I want to thank you for listening today. You can see my email and Twitter here, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Good morning. This is Meet the Data Jobs Dataset, a lightning talk for RDAP 2021. I'm Abigail Gobin at Hedgylib on Twitter, and I'm the data management librarian at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I'm also presenting today on behalf of Liang Tang, who is at the University of Chicago. So what was our intent? About 10 years ago, I began to capture US academic library job ads that mentioned data management. Initially, I was just curious, but over time, I wanted to identify the trends that were starting to emerge as librarians were being hired to address data management needs following the DMP requirements from the National Science Foundation. Ultimately, what this has become is an opportunity for me to better understand creating a large open data set of my own. Job ad analysis within the library literature is pretty common, and we already have several examples of this in data librarianship, including one presented previously at RDAP by Joanna Thielen and Amy Nieser. But the limitations of these job ads is they have focused specifically on data librarianship as a title where you have to have that phrase and words. And I knew that there were a lot more librarians working with data management with those specific obligations, but who might not have the specific title. And I wanted to make sure I was capturing that. This is not to scale an overall project timeline of the last 10 years. In 2011, I began to collect job ads and these were in an email format. In 2018, I was able to get some funding to hire student employees who began the data extraction, moving the data from emails and the absolute mess into a more structured format. Liang joined the project in 2019 to work on his honors capstone and to really help me with a lot of data cleaning. COVID did set us back longer than I had hoped or intended, but we are finalizing the data right now for future release. These are the parameters of the data set. It is entirely in English language. What I'm looking for is academic library job ads. So not government, not any other kind of place where data librarians might be working right now needed to be in the United States or affiliated with those institutions and captured from major job sites, ALA job ad, code for lib, listserv, et cetera. And if a job ad appeared again six months after originally it was posted, we counted that as a new job ad. 
These are extremely preliminary numbers, but I have 1,733 job ads. These are drawing from 50 different job sources and 342 unique institutions. And the most popular job titles I have extracted from the work I'm doing in Open Refine, Data Services Librarian is the most popular title. However, just underneath that is Science Librarian, STEM Librarian, Engineering Librarian. So we know that data management is playing a significant role in these science, STEM, social science job ads. So what are my next steps? I'm working on paper one, which will be an introduction to the data set and we'll have descriptive statistics, have all of that information about methods and limitations of how we cleaned the data so far. And I'm hoping to be able to answer, of, are we through the heyday of data library and hiring? When that paper is published, we hope to also simultaneously then release the data set, aiming for summer of 21, maybe fall in our institutional repository, which at UIC is called Indigo. It is on the Figshare platform, so we should be able to do some versioning over time. There are so many potential research questions that I think could be asked of this data set. These are just a few. Looking at the science librarians, looking at what resources are mentioned to encourage people to apply as their staff, as their space, are their colleagues. And I hope someone will do identifying the absolute unicorn job ads we have seen over the past 10 years. I'm happy to answer any questions. Please do feel free to contact me at my email address, and I will look forward to sharing the data set with you very soon. to a Sensitive Data Toolkit for Researchers Supporting Sensitive Data Sharing in Canada, or Supporting Sensitive Data Sharing for short. Hello, my name is Victoria Smith and I'm the Policy, Privacy and Sensitive Data Coordinator for the Portage Network. So this presentation is about a toolkit for researchers to help them share their sensitive data. But first things first, what is sensitive data? Well, it's information that must be safeguarded against unwarranted access or disclosure. And I want you to keep this word unwarranted in mind. Now, in research, very often when we're talking about human subject research in particular, sensitive data is gonna mean personal information or personal health information. Typically, these data are de-identified when they're used in research. This means the direct identifiers have been removed and the remaining indirect identifiers don't allow the level of risk to go above low or very low. So you might be wondering then, if sensitive data needs to be safeguarded, should we be sharing it? And the short answer is yes, absolutely, uh, but don't take my word for it. Let's check out what the TCPS2 has to say. So that's the Federal Research Ethics Policy. It says there are many reasons to conduct secondary analysis, including to avoid duplication and reduce burdens on participants, to corroborate or to criticize, to look at comparison of change over time, to apply new tests or hypotheses, and to confirm that data are authentic. So here's the paradigm shift. It's powerful, but nuanced. In the current model, your research ethics applications, your consent form templates, all of these things presume that data will be destroyed. The default model is single use data. What we're suggesting is that you approach every instance of data collection with at least the possibility of preservation and data sharing in mind. So including things like future use and broad use in your consent form, for example. And when you do this, this doesn't mean that the important sensitive data are no longer being safeguarded. What it means is that when access is warranted, it can be granted. So think about this like recycling in the same way that we now say no to single use plastics, or at least we think you know, pretty hard about ourselves when we're using them. Um, this is how researchers should be thinking about single use data sets. Um, avoid creating single use data sets wherever possible because it's wasteful. It's wasteful of the research infrastructure that allows the data collection to take place. And it's wasteful of the value inherent in that data set. So start thinking about how you can reuse, reduce, and recycle in your research, how you can allow other researchers to reuse your data, where you can find opportunities to reduce burdens and expense by, re uh, by reusing data, and opportunities to recycle data from other researchers that can help flesh out your research. 
So our toolkit helps researchers to feel more confident understanding sensitive data sharing. And it provides consent form language examples that you can adapt for your studies. <laughs> there are three parts, a glossary, a risk matrix, and a section on consent language I just mentioned. And you might be surprised to learn that sharing your sensitive data can actually make your research more ethical. So yes, there is an increased risk to privacy when, collected, when data are collected and when data are shared, but you can manage and mitigate that risk. And at the same time, avoiding data sharing undermines participant autonomy in cases where they want and choose to share their data more broadly, where that participant consents to undertake those privacy risks. In most studies, the primary benefit of participation is contributing to science. So reusing data allows those participant contributions to continue to be of value, to continue to contribute to science. And for researchers, greater access to more sensitive data means certain kinds of studies become more accessible. So the use of historic controls, as well as multi-site reproducibility and comparison of change studies, just to name a few. So there are three parts to our toolkit. They're available in English and in French. I strongly recommend that you check them out. The links are here available in the slide. And I would also strongly suggest that you get in touch should you have any questions or feedback or comments on the presentation or on the toolkit. Thanks so much and have a great day. All right, y'all, that was our last lightning talk. We're going to head over to the Q&A and see if we've got any questions. Looks like some of them were um, answered. We only have about five minutes, but I do want to um, repeat those just in case anybody didn't see any of these. Um, the first um, was, did you include GIS data librarians and curators in the jobs data set? Um, and this question was answered by Abigail, who said that yes, um, if they are in academic libraries. Um, another question came in for Abigail as well, and that was, is there any plan to expand beyond library positions? And she um, already answered that as well. Thanks, Abigail. This is so great. <laughs> um, and her answer was probably not. It is much harder to do comparison once you get beyond academic institutions. Also, it'd be really hard for me to get historical ads. Um, and we had one last question again for Abigail. Uh, can you tell us a little more about how the data is structured? And the response was, it's spreadsheet. My students have pulled out common fields like job name, location, source, um, institution, full text of the job ad. Um, and it looks like we have one new open question. And this is from Rebecca for Victoria. And the question is, is the sensitive data toolkit mostly for human subject research or for other types of sensitive data? For example, geolocation information for protected species. Um, so thank you so much. That's an excellent question. Uh, there's a strong emphasis on human subject research uh, insofar as there's a lot of work on consent form language. Um, but certainly I'd suggest that the glossary and the risk matrix um, would be worthwhile for any researcher working with restricted or protected data. Thank you. All right, it looks like that was our last open question. I'm just gonna double check there's none that slipped in through the chat. Um, looks like we are caught up on questions. Um, Reed and Amelia, I'll turn it back over to y'all. I do believe that we are going into a short break before our um, next panel. So back to you all. Great, thank you, Melissa, for your uh, moderation of the panel, and thank you to our uh, Lightning Talk presenters. Uh, we, since we do have a couple minutes, we'll extend the break. Um, we'll take a short twelve-minute break, and uh, we'll start our closing keynote session. So, uh, we'll see you then. And uh, this webinar will stay active uh, for the next section. So. We'll
Figshare is an easy-to-use research data repository system that allows academics to make all of their research outputs available in a citable, shareable, and discoverable manner. It also allows research data managers to manage the curation of files, keep account of their institution's research outputs, and measure the impact of those outputs. You can quickly and easily upload any file on Figshare, from PDFs, papers, and datasets, to code, 3D printable files, and video. You control the ownership, the storage, the DOIs, the licenses, and the metadata. And we take care of the rest.
Figshare is an easy-to-use research data repository system that allows academics to make all of their research outputs available in a citable, shareable, and discoverable manner. It also allows research data managers to manage the curation of files, keep account of their institution's research outputs, and measure the impact of those outputs. You can quickly and easily upload any file on Figshare, from PDFs, papers, and datasets, to code, 3D printable files, and video. You control the ownership, the storage, the DOIs, the licenses, and the metadata. And we take care of the rest. Hi everyone, welcome back to our closing session. Can you believe it? We've gotten to the end of our summit and I'm gonna hand it over to Hannah to introduce our closing keynote speakers and moderate that session. Hi everyone. Um, so thank you for attending our closing keynote presentation today at the 2021 RDAP Summit. Um, just a couple of reminders, uh, you've probably heard these already, but this is a Zoom webinar. Attendees are muted and your cameras are turned off. To ask questions, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. The session will run from 12 noon to 1 p.m. Pacific time, which is 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern, with the last 10 to 15 minutes reserved for question and answers. As you may know by now, we also have a Discord server set up for more informal conversations running throughout the summit. So please feel free to continue the discussion or conversation on that platform. 
Also just a reminder that we have a code of conduct policy. The Research Data Access and Preservation Summit organizers are committed to providing an environment where all attendees can participate fully in the program and activities without fear of harassment or discriminatory behavior of any kind. There's a code of conduct helper available during the session who you may contact if you need assistance. Um, please report any violations by contacting the code of conduct officers in Discord, emailing code of conduct at rdapassociation.org, or by completing the incident form. All of that information is pinned in the code of conduct um, Discord channel. And finally, I'd like to introduce our uh, presenters. So I'd like to welcome Christina Gosnell and Zane Salvins from the Catalyst Cooperative. Catalyst Cooperative is an organization focused on putting public energy data to work in the public interest by providing it to researchers, advocates, and journalists. Christina Gosnell has spent the last 10 years researching and organizing to advocate uh, to advance climate, energy, climate and energy policy. Her experience includes assisting research at the National Renewable Energy Lab, contributing to the National Solar Power Permitting Database at Clean Power Finance, and managing data-driven advocacy programs and public utility data to support engagement with the Colorado Public Utility Commission at Clean Energy Action. As president and co-founder of Catalyst Cooperative, Christina enjoys working at the intersection of public data, utility policy, and database design. Zane Salvens is described as Catalyst Cooperative's chief data wrangler, having spent his PhD working on planetary exploration projects, including developing computational techniques for studying the surface geology of icy moons in the outer solar system, Zane later turned his focus to our own planet and decided to work on keeping Earth habitable instead. And after years as the director of research at the nonprofit Clean Energy Action, Zane became a co-founder of Catalyst Co-op, where he leads the technical side of the team, developing an open platform for public data related to US electric utilities. Zane and Christina, take it away. Thanks. I'm going to share my screen and then always a nice little technical moment. Okay. Okay, so um, as Hannah mentioned, we're both founders of Catalyst Cooperative. Uh, which is a small worker-owned data consultancy, mostly serving academic energy system researchers and clean energy advocates. And we're, we're super excited to be here in particular today because um, we're not professional research archivists. And we've kind of fallen into that role by accident and by necessity. So we're very interested to hear any, like, any feedback or comments that you have about our journey um, and how we could be actually, you know, maybe doing it better. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Christina to do the, the initial slides. Grant. Um, yeah, thanks. For, thanks for inviting us. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, yeah. Um, so we're going to go over a, a bit of like how we see data as a catalyst for change. We're going to use the electricity context that we're like the most familiar with as a sort of example, um, but hopefully um, kind of make that like uh, make use that to illuminate kind of broader contexts in the like data for change space. And then um, and Zane's going to take us through why why we chose to, to do this with open do, do our work with open data and some like general lessons learned from our technical um, uh, process. And then I'm going to uh, talk about how we have uh, in, in recent past like pivoted towards more and more um, work towards accessibility and like making our data as accessible as possible. Then we're going to do some quick, quick recaps and then take questions. We're going to try to save a lot of time uh, at the end for questions. So uh, keep them coming. Grand. Okay. So, um, so Catalyst, uh, as, as they noted, sort of sprung out of advocacy and sprung out of necessity. Um, we had an, we had a need to access better data about the energy system and, um, and so that's kind of where our original space was. As Zane said, we kind of fell into doing data curation. Um, so in we were involved in a group of advocates in Colorado. Uh, uh, we were participating in, we were like advocating for early retirement of coal plants. And um, our groups, like the larger strategy of our group was to find the coal plants that were uh, expensive unprofitable and uh, very emitting. So they, you know, they had a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
to find that sweet spot of like low hanging fruit type coal plants. Um, that finding, uh, finding those plants ended up taking, like involved a lot of hand scraping of PDFs and like tedious data compilation. But um, it was the, the, the resulting advocacy was very effective. Um, and we, we saw like clear results from the advocacy that was uh, kind of buttressed by that, by the data collection. And our, our broader team was excited about expanding to target many, many more utilities um, and many more coal plants across the country. And given that, we realized that we needed to, we needed some pivot. Um, so we, we couldn't keep doing this like artisanal bespoke um, data curation. So we decided to um, kind of create Catalyst to house the mission of um, like kind of open data curation for the energy space. And we decided that a new organization was necessary for this because the there really seem to be two pre-existing patterns of data production in, in this um, advocacy and, and also research space. There's commercial data providers like S&P who make large upfront investments in cleaning, packaging the data for easy use and creating all of these reusable data products. But then they you know, kind of meter access to those products and recoup their initial investments um, by charging people for access um, forever. And then on the advocacy and research side, um, there's a lot of people that will kind of scrape this data for their own purposes for some particular project that they're working on. Um, and they really just do a good enough job for that very narrow uh, purpose. And so that data ends up being shared often in a research context, um, but it's not very useful for anybody else. So we saw this as a classic collective action problem, and we really wanted to take on the role of doing a, a good enough job that the data was, was useful for a wide variety of uses, um, but without hiding it behind a paywall. We wanted to provide a, a public good um, so that researchers and advocates could spend their time doing um, you know, actual advocacy work or novel research instead of having to do the same repetitive data collection tasks over and over again without producing anything of lasting value um, within the, the data space. And you know, if we're successful in this, it will also mean that this data is available for other users who would not have had the resources or skills necessary to either purchase or um, prepare the data for themselves. Great. Um, so I'm going to take us through our general theory of change and how, how and when we see data playing a role in a uh, uh, public policy change space. Uh, so, and we're going to use our clean energy context as an example to highlight general patterns in, uh, uh, in, this, in this world. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty clear to me as a human that like every blank, insert your social woe here is a public policy failure. So every, in our context, every coal plant, but also like every police killing, every SUV, every person sleeping, needing to sleep on the street, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are all uh, failures of collective action and we can solve um, these problems with enough imagination uh, and, and work uh, with also with collective action. We socially engineer every bit of our kind of society and whether and that's whether or not we're like actively thinking that we're doing that or deciding to do that. Um, not everyone agrees with me on that point, <laughs> but that's the that's the lens that I see like change through. And um, so that'll like very much color the rest of this, the rest of this talk, especially this section. Um, and in, in the energy space in particular, the uh, it, it's the energy space is highly regulated and that it's it's been highly regulated since its inception. Um, and so we, in, in the electricity and energy space, it's really, really clear that uh, policy changes the outcomes. Um, and we can kind of imagine very, very different outcomes here. Great. Um, so in, in any policy space, it's really important to first start, uh, to first start by asking some uh, pretty basic like theory of change questions. So, you know, who are the decision makers? Who influences the decision makers? And what are the, what are their general motivations and incentives? In my opinion, only after like deeply interrogating the answers to those questions can can we actually answer whether or not data can uh, 
can pr provide a, can can play a role in change making. It can either like drive a wedge in a certain space or shift a power dynamic. Um, so in our context, the decision makers are generally speaking the like legislators, the regulators, and the utilities, which you know own and operate the um, fossil fuel infrastructure across the country. Um, so the regulators care about uh, keeping energy affordable and reliable. That's their general mandate. It has been for almost 100 years. The utilities, like all kind of companies, care about profits. Um, and Given that context, that is uh, that is why we have we chose as a like advocacy strategy to focus on and target those coal plants which are um, uneconomic and not not making the utility a ton of money. Um, so, so in theory, the the regulators are supposed to care about them, um, are supposed to care about that, and the utilities at the very least uh, won't won't uh, be, will be less adversarial to early closure of those types of plants. And in, in all this, in all kind of public policy and uh, advocacy spaces, it's important to kind of understand general actors motivations uh, and understand how willing one actor is to go against another. Um, so in like in some states, the, uh, the legislators and regulators are very willing to um, make rules that the utilities aren't particularly excited about in the first place. And in some states, that's very much not the case. So it's important to kind of understand the, um, the landscape that you're inside of. Great. Um, so in, so how, how and where does data play a role here? Uh, regulators in particular are, um, especially in the public, public utility context, they're ostensibly very data-driven bodies. They make they make really kind of detailed and integrated decisions about economics and technical the technical specs of the um, of the utility system, and um, so they they need a lot of data and expertise in order to make good decisions. Um, and and who do you, who do you think has a lot of uh, expertise and data about the utility system? The utilities. <laughs> um, so this this dynamic is a classic example of uh, information asymmetry, where the utilities um, have kind of all of the power to set the set the agenda and set um, sort of steer the regulatory decision making process in their favor. Um, and this is where we see advocates come in, uh, and where we think data can play an important role. Um, so in 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 our world, uh, we try to help at we try to like help the advocates get the data they need to challenge the utilities assumptions in front of their regulators, and make sure that the regulators are asking like asking good questions <laughs> and um, sort of like peering behind the black box of the utility like decision making and modeling process. Um, and in a lot of these contexts, the data that we end up like providing to advocates or, or other advocates just use in general, it doesn't need to be like the most ironclad um, data, the most nitty gritty granular information about the system. Like the, the it, it needs to it needs to be credible enough to shift the narrative and and like change the like potential um, to like make the regulators think maybe we should ask the, the utilities to like change some assumptions and. Uh, and, and present their, their data in a different way. Um, so, so definitely wanna um, note that we do not believe, like constitutionally do not believe that more data necessarily leads to better public policy outcomes. Um, good data is really important to tell, tell stories, but, but those, those stories are, and the, and the stories and the data itself are not sufficient for, for um, a public policy change and be even changing people's minds. Um, we found often that even when the utilities, even when we found those like kind of perfect coal plants that were very expensive and not making the utility a lot of money, we had to challenge the like long standing assumption that renewable energy was more expensive than existing coal plants. And that, you know, that was the case for a very long time. And because, you know, because the cost of renewable energy has been trending down over the last 10, 15 years, um, it's no longer the case. So we had to like, not only did we have to present them with their individual case, 
we had to shift people's mindsets around um, around the cost calculations of of these technologies, which takes a second uh, for a lot of folks to, to change their priors. Um, there are also like deep ideological barriers to overcome. It, you know, in I think that's that's like very clear in other other like change making contexts in climate specifically. There, you know, we've had a ton of really good data about how the climate is changing and how humans are causing that. And if you don't like the the solutions that um, that climate change kind of me like means we have to employ, then you're not going to want to integrate the, the idea of climate change into your into your um, sort of worldview. And that's really similar with like police brutality and racial injustice. There's been a ton of great work of folks like compiling uh, compiling data about police brutality across the country and and like just because we have the right data, we're not going to necessarily convince people. Um, but it is, uh, you know, unquestionably important. It's just not not always the whole picture. And the last point here is that data can't data can't make decisions for us. Um, we use our values to make decisions, given the like context that the data provides. I think you know. I think the. COVID has uh, illuminated that really, really clearly for me and sort of made me cringe every time people say like science will make the decisions because science doesn't make decisions. Science tells us information and we have to um, we have to make make decisions based on our values, given that context. All right, I'm going to pass it off to Zane. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why we did ultimately choose to use open data in um, our context and how that maybe generalizes to other policy and advocacy based change making. So the first argument, which is probably the most obvious um, and is the moral case, you know, this data is a public good. It was produced by public agencies with public funding, so it should be available to everyone, um, especially to people who are acting in the public interest. Um, that, that seems like a fairly straightforward case um, that applies also to a lot of research that's publicly funded. Like, should the papers, should the data, should the outcomes be available to everyone? And in many senses, federal data especially is already free. Uh, the federal government can't copyright its own works. Um, you don't have to pay for the data, and it's not legally encumbered. <clears throat> However, you do actually have to pay for the data, just not with money. You have to pay for it with, with work, with toil. Um, and that's because the way that it's published is not immediately usable. So there's a lot of kind of tedious work and, and cleaning that has to happen before you can use the data to make policy and do analysis. And this toil, in effect, it acts as a paywall, effectively locking out many potential users, um, especially users who uh, would be acting in the public interest. <clears throat> A lot, of, a lot of change making involves struggling against uh, incumbent interests. So interests that are well adapted to the historical, economic, and political landscape um, that are you know, typically very powerful. In our case, this is the utilities um, that have large existing investments in fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and often these incumbent interests in a variety of sectors, they already have access to the best available data related to the policymaking context. So liberating public data doesn't directly affect them, really. It doesn't make um, their lives any easier or harder, except insofar as it affects other stakeholders. And so in, in this utility um, regulatory context, you can we can start to level the playing field a little bit because there are disempowered stakeholders that don't have no data. And if we provide data to everyone in an open platform, then they are differentially helped um, and that can change the overall uh, power dynamic and erode the incumbent advantage to some degree. Um, there's also the potential for accumulation of value in the public sphere. So uh, a lot of open platforms they're trying to assemble many small incremental contributions into a resource that's more valuable than anything anybody could have created by themselves. And the kind of the modern canonical example of this is Wikipedia. Um, but ultimately, this is also what the scientific endeavor has been about for you know, the last couple hundred years. Um, this kind of accumulation of value, it's not impossible to do in a closed proprietary system, but open systems are, are really, they're trying to maximize the pool of potential contributors. 
Open platforms also, they typically make a very explicit commitment to their contributors and users about the future of the system that they're investing their efforts in. And this is important for making trust, um, building trust. These commitments are, they're explicitly encoded in the choice of licenses that are associated with the, the project and its outputs. Um, a lot of progress has been made in the last decade um, with standardizing these licenses. Um, you're probably familiar with the Creative Commons licenses for um, more cultural works, and the open source initiative kind of has helped to organize a taxonomy of um, technological licenses for copyrighted works like software. Um, for our work, we've chosen to use permissive licenses. So the MIT license in the context of software and the Creative Commons attribution license for everything else. And we actually write these licenses into all of our contracts with clients, our grant applications, and our fiscal sponsorship agreements so that everybody who's participating in the work knows exactly what they're getting into up front. Um, there are some other kind of smaller reasons why open data might be appropriate in a change-making context. Um, it can enable better user discovery. So we don't have to have a pre-existing relationship or a conversation at all with a, a potential user. Um, this can really lower the barrier to entry for new users, especially those that are a little bit more technically um, savvy. It's, in our case, um, made our funding more closely aligned with our underlying mission. So it would, in some ways, be easier to monetize a closed data and software system, but that would, at a basic level, put our economic interests as an organization somewhat at odds with our broader mission of em empowering as many different kinds of people to work with this information as possible in the public interest. Um, an open platform, also, it makes it easier for us to to go to philanthropic or public funding agencies because they often have a very explicit priority of generating public goods. Um, and that's also what we want to do. As a new and small organization, we also uh, have credibility issues that other large established proprietary um, corporations might not have. Um, so transparency is one way that we can potentially build credibility in a policy making space because all of our data, all of our software, the entire process that we're using um, to perform the analysis is available for scrutiny by anybody. Um, and that's kind of a way for us to bootstrap um, credibility um, in the work that we do. But it's not necessarily true that open data is always going to be best for, for change making. Um, so it may be that there is no advantageous differential impact to liberating the data. And that would happen in uh, a case where maybe the incumbents don't have access to some special uh, domain specific data that you do have. And if you made it open, then you'd be you know, further tilting the playing field in, in their direction and giving up an advantage that you, you have with this um, secret data. Um, a less strong argument might be that you have equally matched opponents, maybe like a big, big solar industry associations and uh, incumbent utilities. They both have essentially unlimited access to funds if they choose to wield them um, in an advocacy context. So, you know, the open data probably isn't going to have a big differential impact in that context. Um, economic sustainability, you know, the flip side of access to philanthropic and public funding through grants is that, you know, we are potentially giving up some opportunities for monetizing the work that we're doing. Um, and if pushing to shove and we had to choose between either um, doing the work behind a paywall or not doing the work at all, you know, it might be very reasonable for us to, and, and others, to choose to do the work behind a paywall because then you, at least you get to keep doing it. You can then like explicitly choose to provide differential access to different kinds of users. You know, so the scrappy gr grassroots organizers, maybe you give it to them for free. Um, the medium-sized NGOs, you charge them, uh, you know, a middle rate and the clearly for-profit um, renewable energy developers, you can charge them a normal consulting rate. And you always have the option later on, if you've licensed the data um, appropriately, to, to open it up for use by everyone once that becomes economically viable again. The, the flip side of you know, trying to build credibility through transparency is that sometimes that transparency can be weaponized against you. Um, so often the, the kind of proprietary data providers have an assumption of credibility. Um, the utilities, like everybody assumes that they know what they're talking about when they're um, bringing their own data to bear in a regulatory proceeding. And so open data and open software can sometimes be subject to disproportionate scrutiny um, that can put you at a disadvantage if the narrative kind of goes wrong. <clears throat> um, another 
Another thing that we've noticed, and this is kind of the flip side of the, the easier user discovery, is that it can be very challenging to track usage um, with a completely open product. So people can download our software, download our data. They never need to talk to us. Um, you know, depending on what platform you're using to disseminate the data and software, you may or may not have good tracking of that information. Um, unfortunately, there isn't the same kind of robust uh, community norms around data and software citation that there is around um, kind of peer-reviewed research paper citation. So that's that's something that um, we, we feel like could be done better. There could be more kind of programmatic tracking and uh, stronger community enforcement of citation of data and software. And that would make it easier for us to understand like who is using the data, how are they using it, and um, how can we improve it and serve their needs better over time. Um, but on balance, obviously, we've chosen to do open data because in this particular application that we're working in, we feel like it is clearly advantageous and aligned with our underlying mission. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about more technical learnings that we have um, generated over the last five years of working this data, um, starting from you know, really being the spreadsheet user who, you know, doesn't have these advanced tools at hand and, um, you know, evolving to something that's more like a distributed um, cloud-based data pipeline. So we've been kind of thrust into the role of archiving and curating public data sets unexpectedly because a lot of government agencies are really not they're not even attempting to follow best practices in this, um, especially when data isn't their primary mission. So the scientific and statistical agencies do pretty well. You know, they understand what the best practices are and, and generally try and follow them. The regulatory agencies are not so much into that. They're, they're really, it's not a focus that they've um, really taken on thus far. Um, the data is often not programmatically accessible at all. You know, you, can, you may be able to download it from a web page, but it's really they're envisioning somebody clicking and downloading a spreadsheet, not uh, a program. Um, there's no revision control or change logs at all. Old versions of the data disappear completely with, you know, no notification and no um, explanation as to why. Uh, and of course, our data and, you know, most data processing pipelines expect a particular set of inputs with a particular um, format and particular contents. Um, so early on in our, in our work, these unexpected changes on the government kind of publication side would break everything unpredictably. We'd have to race around and fix, um, you know, find the new file format or, you know, understand what the new URL was for that spreadsheet or whatever. Um, and this, it ended up being very disruptive and felt like kind of um, a waste of effort. Like it, it didn't need to be that way. And as a result, we've ended up building our own kind of um, ad hoc data archiving uh, system. So we use web scrapers to pull down the data periodically from the government sites, and we need to maintain those web scra scrapers as an independent kind of, um, but somewhat decoupled step in our data processing pipeline. And then we you know, wrap the, the original files, we zip them up and wrap those zip files in a little bit of metadata that's stored in JSON. And we push that whole um, pile of stuff up to Zenodo, which is a, a research archiving service you're probably familiar with, run by CERN. Um, and then we can use Zenodo's API and the metadata that we store in JSON to programmatically pull down a particular version of a particular file that came from um, a given you know, regulatory agency and use that very reliably accessible um, raw input to feed into our, our overall pipeline. And then deal with scraping the new mess on our own time when we've decided that that's necessary and appropriate. Um, and it really seems like there should probably be better community tools for this, um, for systematically creating and curating ad hoc, ar ad hoc archives, because I'm sure that this is not the only place that this problem exists. Um, we also do a little bit of conversion of archaic formats into modern formats without changing the contents or structure at all. So FERC, for whatever reason, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, is really enamored with the visual FoxPro databases, which they've been using since at least the mid-90s. Um, and so they still publish a lot of their data in that format, which is, you know, deprecated by almost um, you know, all other software packages. The, the software hasn't been updated in 13 years. So we convert that immediately into an SQLite database and archive the entire SQLite database um, so that people can at least access that raw data um, using relatively modern tools. Okay. Um, we also, of course, we do a lot of transformation of the data in, in the pipeline. And there's, there's always a tension in that processing that uh, between 
preserving the original data uh, and being, you know, having a high fidelity representation of that information and making it easy to use, right? Because a lot of what is making it um, difficult to use is the fact that, you know, it its original form is not very clean. Um, you know, the contents can be bad sometimes. It's not very tidy. It's it's cluttered. Um, it's not in a you know a well normalized, more database like format. And so we always have to choose between. Um, you know, preservation and utility. And more and more over time, we've turned um, more to immediate usefulness um, for our users because, again, that toil is a paywall. Like the data, it really is not free. Um, it's not open until it's easy to use. And of course, we, we try and preserve the opportunity for users to do their own data transformations if they feel that's important. But on balance, people don't want to do that. They want research, um, analysis ready data from the get go. And so, more and more, that's really what we try and provide. Um, another way that this comes up is in linking different data sets together. So like FERC, EIA, and EPA, they all have data that um, is related to power plants and utilities and electricity generation facilities, um, but they don't use the same names and IDs for all of those things. So we often have to choose between a fine-grained data set that's isolated, a coarse-grained data set that's integrated, or something that's fine-grained but approximated, where we've kind of made our best guess as to how um, that data should be broken down uh, between different um, entities. Um, but like I said, more and more, we are just trying to make something that is instantly usable for somebody to do novel work um, and uh, or get right into to new advocacy work without having to do any additional work on, on their own. Um, and when we do see something that somebody's act, asking for repeatedly, um, that's probably something we should integrate into the underlying platform. Okay, next slide. Um, okay, so as a tiny little team, we only have four people right now. We've, we've had as many as seven um, at a time in the past, but we have very limited resources in terms of like the hours that we have to work. So we really have no choice but to automate almost everything. Any manual processes quickly accumulate and eat up a lot of our time. As a result, we've moved more and more towards using tools that are maybe associated with larger data sets um, and treating our data as a continuous process rather than a fixed end product. So we run the ETL, you know, you know, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, we're, we're working on getting it running automatically every night, every time a commit is made to the code base um, and updating the raw inputs as well to see um, if they're, they, will, they will work with the process that we have in place. And this seems to be a common theme, like a convergent evolution in a lot of more data intensive business applications and um, research applications. But it's still kind of uncommon in policy adjacent fields and the public sector, unfortunately. So one side effect of this evolution is that we're using tools to produce the data that are very different from the tools that many of our users are gonna use to access the data. So we've we found that we now really have to we have to be very conscientious about doing the necessary work to bridge that technical gap and, and make sure that we don't erect unnecessary technical barriers between um, the data and our target users. And Christina is going to talk more about that, that recent pivot in our focus. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm going to talk about how we have been uh, sort of shifting our, our kind of attention towards um, making uh, towards providing more and more access to our data in different formats. So <laughs> I'm gonna take us take take you through our like kind of concentric circles and rings of uh, of access modes um, and layers here. So thus far uh, we've primarily been focused on these kind of inner rings. Uh, There's a lot of stuff that Dane was covering, the like getting everything to a standard format making sure the data is clean and tidy, so like nice and neat and um, in a nice format, and connecting the data, like the same, like pulling in the different, um, connecting one power plant from one data set to the same power plant in the other data set. And um, we've been focused on these, this like inner ring in part because it's like, this is foundational. We need, we need the like a data processing pipeline that is runs well and like produces a nice data output in order to even think about sharing it. Um, and it also like this has this, these rings have uh, sucked up a tremendous quantity of our time. Um, so we, we've had to, we, because the data sets that we're working with are like quite messy and dirty in their original form. Um, uh, these rings, these like, especially the clean and tidy and connected actually um, take a lot of effort for us. Um, but at, so at this stage, uh, in terms, if, if you were a user trying to interact with our uh, like our software at this stage, you know there there is a uh, 
data processing pipeline that we have a like software package that you can like install and run the data processing pipeline but um and some more technical users definitely do that and uh and run the full uh, run the full pipeline work on the data directly but not everyone wants to do that and not everyone has the expertise or like technical technical know-how to do that um and uh, you know at this stage one of the one of the nice benefits for us is that we we are able here to like share our output with um with our end users especially like our advocate allies that kind of don't have this the technical know-how um and so we were able to like get the data out into the world but it's still kind of in a bes bespoke way um and only for kind of highly technical users the next set of set of circles here is all it has to do with an, like basically analysis and calculated values so um the imputing missing values and derived values as they were saying like we have um had had a pretty like stark line of the we're trying to keep the the data as as the, as close to our the original data sets as we can um but that's not how users want to access and interact with the data they like things that they want analysis ready data and filling in the gaps um is a tremendous uh, quantity of there's a tremendous quantity of toil in filling in the gaps and there's also a a, a lot of like derived values that um are kind of are commonplace at this at this point um and when when we have a like highly vetted um repeatable like repeated methodology we are we have been more and more shifting to like integrating that methodology into our like like uh processing pipeline and making sure that 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 analysis and that like outputted calculated value is accessible to everyone because you know, if everyone is going to calculate the like capacity factor of coal plants um, over and over and over again, it's the same kind of it's a, it's a, it's just another barrier to getting to like novel answers um, to interesting questions. And and by like integrating into the system, we can accumulate that value over time. Um, but then there's like how users actually like interact and um, and play with the data and have access to it our our previous philosophy around this was that we wanted like one flow like one one data processing pipeline that outputs one format that serves a ton of different users and more and more we have been realizing that um that doesn't really work <laughs> um, or it, like it, it serves both uh, like multiple kinds of users like kind of poorly um so we've now like we've now been shifting to thinking about uh, thinking about like dissemination and access in a in a very different as a very different like stage in our process. So like these like the blue and green circles are really the like it that's the that's the processing pipeline and once once at at the, at the end of that processing pipeline, uh, the data is can then be like flowed out into very different um, places. And a large part of the reason that we're um, like really thinking about this is because our 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 setup right now doesn't exactly serve our past selves, the spreadsheet users who like want access to the data about their individual um, their individual utility or like want to do quick analyses um, and in spreadsheets. And there's a as you probably know like a tremendous quantity of spreadsheet users in the world and like folks who can do analysis in um, in spreadsheets and don't have the like programmatic kind of technical expertise. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think there, there. I think in some like more technical spaces, there's some ways a taboo around spreadsheet analysis. But like, it's very effective, um, and and we need to like meet users where they're at. Um, grant. So we are going to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about the like tools that we're. Uh, we are planning on using for 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 dissemination. Uh, dataset is our is the tool that we have started to use for those spreadsheet users. We're very excited about dataset. Um, it's dataset's a, like a, a lightweight interface between SQLite databases and the web, so a user can um, a user can just sign on to like like log on to a web page. See all of the like see all of the tables that we have integrated into our system. Uh, browse them. They can you know uh, select portions of them with drop down menus. There's like automatic maps that are generated if there's a little, like lat long in the um, in the data set. You can write SQL queries if uh, 
if folks are into that kind of thing and can download data as CSVs. So it makes like an easy portable um, uh, system for folks to like look at the data, see, if, see they need it, extract it from data set, use it for their own cases. Um, and it's quite easy for us to update, which is nice. Um, and there's the, the like Jupyter notebooks and Docker container setup. So um, this is for like obviously more savvy uh, uh, Python users and with a minimal setup. So we can like, sh we can share our pre-processed data and uh, the and the software environment that like helps folks you like interact with it and like the tools that we've developed to um, interact with our our data and not have folks have to worry about the a lot of the setup stuff um, or running the, the processing pipeline. The next uh, the next tool here we are very excited about deploying, which is called Intake, and um, Intake basically wraps data libraries in Conda packages. So which makes data catalogs installable. And it, so it Intake will pro provide like a, a, a uniform interface for users and handle all of the like data conversion, caching and version control. Um, and we think this is gonna be like really make, make it really easy for users um, to like immediately kind of interact and use the puddle data without having to worry about like how it was generated. The next setup here, um, the next tool set here is uh, Jupyter Hub, which is very, very similar to the Jupyter Notebooks and Docker, but it's the like no setup version um, in terms of how like users interact with it. So um, that's literally like log on to a web, web page with a with with some credentials and you are like pop you're popped open you're popped into uh, uh, a Jupyter server where you can play with uh, the you play the data in 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 Jupyter Notebooks. Um, but this and you have access to some a bunch of computing power. And this setup is very, very like no no setup, which is very easy, like useful for us, but it also comes with a, a bit of a price. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, so Jupyter Hub is an example of a, of a tool set that was really designed for the like large data set and like the the analysis needs analyses that need a lot of uh, processing power. And, and that like it has excellent accessibility advantages and per, like provides provides users with like that really easy setup and processing power. But there's a lot of skills and labor that go into the like setup and maintenance of of that system. And, you know, for, for a large, um, for a large, like, data problem that like requires a lot of soft a lot of computing power the the like cost to for the setup and maintenance is like relatively small to the cost of the actual like computing resources needed so it makes the it makes jupyter hub like very like cost effective and reasonable in a like a large data data um, context um but in our context where we have like medium data we like the processing power for needed for our um our use case is quite small. Um, the the like labor and setups is like a much higher bar for us, comparatively speaking. And there are smaller uh, like smaller tools like bind like smaller data tools like Binder that um, provide similar accessibility benefits. But our data is too big for that. So we, we kind of are in this like trough in the middle where um, there's like really good big data tools. There's really good small data tools, and um, we think that there's like you know. We, I, we feel like there's a there's room for like community improvement of these like of this middle ground, and I think that uh, you know we suspect that there's a lot of like research and um, and other applications that fall into this middle as well. And I will just note that I that it's it's pretty clear um, with given with our work with advocates and and the research community that there's a, a lot of overlap in the tools that are required um, for both advocates and and academics so like any investment in tooling in the space um, can help both in the like pure research context and in the like in the like traditional advocacy space Woo. <laughs> um that's all folks no just kidding. um so yeah so it's just like very very quick we're gonna run through the takeaways um the first being that like it's important to develop a, a data centered theory of change before actually like attempting to employ data in a change making space and that more data doesn't necessarily lead to better uh, better social outcomes. 
and yeah, toil, toil is a paywall, data, a paywall. Data is not liberated until it is actually easy for the end user to use. Um, open data also isn't always necessarily better in a change making context. And so you have to evaluate that on a, on a case by case basis. Um, we think that there's a need for better ad hoc data archiving and curation tools. And we would love to understand better what that discussion looks like on the, the professional archivist side, if there is one going on, I imagine there is. Um, and we think that it's most useful to, the most useful data is a living ongoing process, not, not some static final end product. So um, it's just, it's a different kind of archive. Like what does a live archive look like? Yeah. And the, um, a big takeaway for us is that the, the tools for the data production definitely do not equal, like, like definitely not the same tools as, uh, as are needed for access and use. And there's like, often should be and can be and should be a very clear line between those two spaces. Then the last one, just quick recap, because I literally just said it, um, was that we, like, we really think that there's a, there's space to, um, space as a general community to develop, develop more like uh, medium data tool sets for access. Woo. Some quick, quick acknowledgements um, for all, all of our like funders and and uh, advocate allies, and then let's uh, take questions if, if folks have them. I'm gonna stop share my screen now. Okay, great. Thank you, Christina and Zane. That was really interesting. Um, it does look like we have some questions in the chat, so or rather in the question answer panel. Um, I'll just start from the top. Uh, Tess is asking to the both of you. Um, how do you prioritize which data sets to liberate, clean, um, to create drive values for, et cetera? That is a great question. Um, so uh, like as like the, the data sets that we started with really uh, dictate were dictated by the particular advocacy campaign that we were like uh, starting with. But then since then, we really, uh, every time that we've like had the ability to like think about like had the space or resources to um, integrate new data sets and new analysis, we have attempted to spend some time um, like curating, uh, curating needs and like feasibility from our users and from, mm -hmm. and from like our potential users. So like folks that would, would potentially use it if, if they had integrated more data. So we attempt to, we attempt to like kind of open source the, um, the selection process for, for new data. So we've, we've recently kind of recruited an advisory uh, body for the organization too. So we, we selected some people from um, the research community, the advocacy community, the journalist community, um, students, different kinds of users so that they can give us more kind of ongoing focused feedback. Um, we've also really tried to focus on kind of the sweet spot between um, digitally accessible and difficult to access data. So like we're not scraping PDFs that are only available as PDFs, of which there are many, many hundreds of thousands of pages. Um, we're, we're going for things that are already somewhat programmatically usable um, and just building a tool chain that operates on that, that kind of digital resource um, and turns it into a much cleaner, more usable digital resource. Because the, the purely manual data compilation stuff is just, it's just too much. Like you need the mechanical Turk or, or something. Thank you. Um, and then uh, another question from the uh, list here. Um, first, what an amazing project is what they're saying. And could you also talk a little bit more about your funding model? Um, like, are you written into research grants? That's a great question also. <laughs> Very important question. Um, it definitely dictates like how we navigate the world and how we like can and can and, you know, can sustain ourselves in the future. So we, we have been kind of like half in the last few years, uh, half and half funded by um, by foundation funding. Largely the Sloan Foundation has uh, support has supported us to like build out the platforms and tools. And um, with this like a specific focus on the needs of the research community. And also we do consulting work. Um, so like we, we are very familiar with our data and a lot of folks, we end up like, we were talking about the analysis kind of layers and derived and calculated values. We end up like, we know that uh, like analysis is a 
is a barrier because people pay us to um, mm -hmm. to do analysis on our own data or on you know on this data and like attempt to build build value that way. So and whenever we can, we um, we actually always at this at this point we um, and enable the like the integration of client like client work and client analysis. So, uh, we can put it into that like put it back into our tool set. Um, we haven't, and you can maybe talk about that. Um, What's it? the consortium? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's, it's a mix, right? I mean, we've, we've got some grant funding, we've got some client funding. Um, and as far as being written into research grants, I think going forward, we would like to have kind of a, a membership program or like a collection of people that benefit from having the data and want to give us, you know, direction and feedback on what we should prioritize um, integrating or, or how we should prepare it. And also, you know, pay us some like ongoing kind of subscription um, fee, but obviously with a purely open data project that that either has to be um, just goodwill or they need to be, you know, getting some other benefit, which might be that helping us helping us prioritize their own um, their own needs. But we're we're figuring it out as we go, and um, I feel like we've been very lucky to. Uh, be able to pay to do this and paid to to learn a lot of this um the stuff that we wouldn't have wouldn't have known otherwise these tools yeah definitely so i see two kind of related questions here so my flag going off um and i'm just gonna put them together for you because i think they are they could be answered together first is do you produce reports of usage and then the second one is um how do you find out if someone has used your data i think they are you know, tied together yeah, we, we, we don't really, unfortunately. Um, so we have like the GitHub repository statistics. We have the Zenodo download statistics. Um, you know, we know how many people have started the project on GitHub, but we don't have, you know, a lot of information. And what, one of the things that we're hoping to get out of um, the more directly cloud accessible data, so using intake and storage buckets, um, the data set instance where people would access it is, we'll have logs from all of those live resources. And that will give us much more detailed information going forward about which data people are using, um, where those users are, um, and potentially what institutions they're part of. Um, so in a couple of years, you know, after this next round of work, we, we hope to be much better informed about that. Yeah, and I see us uh, like a slice of that question in the chat, which is about like, do we do we have case studies for folks using our our data in the like regulatory and policy space? Um, and and the answer to that is lar I think is largely yes. Um, and mostly because we are like in community and in conversations with a lot of the folks that are using our data in the in the policy space. I'm sure there are folks that are using it that we don't know about because um, they occasionally pop up um, from the woodwork. But, you know, a lot of our um, even our initial allies, like they 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 ping us whenever they like publish a paper or are like, you know, pushing for some legislation that ends up getting enacted uh, that they um, you know, they let it, they let us know when our data is has making an impact, which is very nice. Um, and I think wouldn't happen in, if if we didn't really like come from that community and are still in very much in conversation and um, in community with them. Thank you. Um, uh, there's also a question here from Tess, who is asking about uh, what do you use for your data integrity checks as you're doing all this processing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so that also is a, a major focus of our ongoing work is trying to um, make the data validations very transparent and easy to incrementally improve over time. So if a user finds a problem um, and they have a little code snippet for you know identifying that problem like a bug report would or a software unit test would, then we can immediately just slap that into our, our test suite. So we use PyTest um, and you know, PyTest pulls, you know, data frames from the, the database and runs some kind of homebrew uh, checks on the data frame. Like kind of, we, we've built statistical schemas for a lot of the variables where, um, you know, there are outline variable values and we don't want to just delete them all um, because it is it is the data that was reported. So we will often specify like the mean or the, the median value should be in this range, the 95 
uh, 95th and 5th percentile um, values should be in these ranges. And if they're not, please let us know. Um, and that's mostly to have kind of guardrails on the ETL process. So if we inadvertently screw something up, um, that doesn't show up in like data types or the software actually failing, but does show up in the values of the data, we get notified that, you know, we've had some unintended impact. But right now it's a, it's a combination of um, PyTest and a bunch of um, you know, pandas data frame manipulations, but we're looking at using uh, Pandera and um, great expectations. Um, and there's a, a library called Hypothesis that lets you kind of make um, more generic statements about what you expect to see in a data frame. Yeah, yeah, but we would love we like you know if anybody has like their favorite data validation. Um, tool set, definitely let us know because it's something that we're still we're still in exploration about because our bespoke version, not as pope, but yeah, our kind of homebrew version feels a little bit janky. Janky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so speaking of tools, uh, in the question and answer tab, Mike is asking if you have thoughts on the littlest Jupyter hub. I have tried several times to set up the littlest Jupyter hub and I have not yet been successful. Um, and eventually, so we're actually, um, we're looking at partnering with 2i2c, which uh, is the International Interactive Computing Collaboration or something like that. It, it's kind of grown out of the Pangeo project, which was an earth science focused kind of big data cloud-based um, Jupyter notebook interface for researchers, especially in climate and the geosciences. Um, the littlest Jupyter hub doesn't, it doesn't give enough resources to do the kind of like, we do have some you know, 100 gigabyte data sets, like long time series. So we need some distributed computational power or a very large instance uh, to, to run the, the kind of analyses and data processing that we want to do. But it's not really a Pangeo cluster. Like we don't need a thousand cores. We need like 16 cores. Um, and <laughs> so Right now, we're hoping to learn from our collaboration with 2i2c more about how to set up and maintain this infrastructure and maybe collaborate with them to develop some like off the shelf, trivial to deploy um, medium data solution. And I think they're also hoping to learn from our type of use case, like what the needs are in that space. Um, and that will hopefully result in something that's like the littlest Jupyter Hub or maybe the medium sized Jupyter Hub um, that you can you know, really just push button deploy and pay for the cloud infrastructure that underlies it, which for small and medium sized data is incredibly affordable. Okay, so we are almost at time, but I think we've got a chance for one more question here. Um, so I'll uh, ask to both of you then, um, are you from Kristen, are you seeing any trends, positive or negative in how the government is making data open? Ooh. <laughs> Uh, another excellent question. So I, yeah, yes. Uh, I think that there, well, yes, on positive trends in general. Uh, although I think that there's, there's like a really big hill to climb um, in order to make data truly accessible. So there's, you know, there's a big initiative that is, has been like data.gov is their like kind of home space. There's like, they're trying to curate and compile all of the all of the like federal reported data, which is great that it's like, it's all in one place. Um, and also, and like, I, they have very, very good intentions behind their project. So I'm excited about that. And also like, if, if they are just like pointing, like making pointers to messy data that the like agencies themselves are not curating, like, no, it's not, it's not really helpful. <laughs> um, and like, like Zane was mentioning before, like there, there are some data, there are some, it, in like agencies in the government that like provide that are like more focused on data. Um, and so they, they are, they are like doing their best. Um, and I like, I, I, I wish those, the staff people there like all the best and um, hope they get more resources to like kind of curate their, their data even better. But like, yeah, like, like Sina was saying, there's some of these like regulatory um, bodies like FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Yeah. They just don't care. It's like not in their like institutional um, incentive and they that's like the only the data is only published there it's like very interesting like and it's it's only there so and it's and it's trash it's like almost impossible to use sometimes yeah. so I, I think there really should be a data directorate probably at, at a very high level in the the federal government and probably state governments too um, that that houses this expertise and like knowledge of the best practices and how to, to work with this infrastructure so that you're not replicating that same 
kind of knowledge base 50 times over in a bunch of different agencies. And there's actually, there's a project at NYU, the, the Coleridge Initiative, I think, um, run by Julia Lane, um, that is attempting to bring some of these more modern best practices into the public sector and, um, you know, doing trainings for people in the various statistical agencies. Um, and she wrote a book recently called Democratizing Our Data, um, a Manifesto, which is like, a very fiery title, um, although the book didn't give me like a ton of hope about like where things are actually going right now, it is, it is a lot of inertia to overcome. Um, but something she points out there is like, there's a real risk that the data, the public data will become irrelevant because it is so hard to access. And there's so many other kind of opportunistic data sets now available for doing a lot of research projects that people now often will just default to using those opportunistic like social media um, or phone based aggregated data data sets instead of using the actual public um, the public goods that are being produced painstakingly by the government all right so um thank you unfortunately we are going to have to wrap this up even though there's a couple more questions um but we have to kick off the business meeting so zane and christina thank you for a very interesting and thought-provoking presentation um, and thank you everyone else as well to coming to this session, uh, for coming to this session. Um, just a reminder that the, the next session is going to be on a separate Zoom link, I believe. Um, so we'll need to close this off and switch over there. Um, but thank you again to our presenters. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you.